July 21st, 1996, interview with Dina Wolf, Ne Denderovic. Interviewer is Lisa Newman in Toronto, Canada, and the interview is in English. Okay. July 21st, 1996, interview with Dina Wolf, Ne Denderovic. Interviewer is Lisa Newman in Toronto, Canada, and the interview is in English. And you are? I am Dina Wolf, Ne Denderovic, born in Warsaw, Poland. April 20th, 1937. And who else was in your family? My mom and dad, Isaac and Hinda Denderovich. My grandmother, Chaya Rachel Denderovich. And my uncle Saul, known as Uncle Shlomi. And these are the people that lived in our apartment together. Your father, Isaac, was born when? He was born March 2nd, 1910. And your mother? She was born June 15th, 1914. And tell me what you remember from those early years in Warsaw, where you lived. Um, there are fragments. Uh, there's no continuation, but fragments of that I remember. My parents, of course, told me where we lived, which was 23 Gainsha. Later on, I understand that was part of the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, I remember my grandmother. She was um, a little lady. And uh, when I was born, she said, oh, another girl. Because her other two sons, who were married already at the time, had girls. This was your father's mother. Right. Uh, my father was the... Um, second youngest of five sons. Now the other two sons perished in the war with the children. Um, my uncle Sam, my father's, that was the middle one, my father's elder brother, came to Canada in 1934. My uncle Saul and my father and mother and I but were survived in Russia. And my grandmother, I was told, perished in the war, after the war actually, or three months before the war ended, by some people, not the Nazis. She was killed. Do you know who killed her? The stories came back that some Poles killed her after the war. Some said it was three months before the war. It's very difficult to know at that time who killed who at what time. The end result is, of course, that she did not survive the war. You said you remembered her. What do you remember her doing? I remember there was a, there was a love, you know. It, it's a feeling, not a memory, but a feeling of, of a memory. Um, we lived in an apartment, and we had, what I do remember is a very long kitchen. At the end of that length was a window. On the right-hand side of that room were two cots, one after the other. The first cot was where my grandmother slept. The one at the head of that was where my Uncle Saul slept. And I used to run in the morning and cuddle with her. And then I would run into my uncle's bed until this day, we joke about it. I take my shirt. As a matter of fact, we have it on film. On his 80th birthday, I took my shirt and tied up to his, because that's what I used to do, tie up my nightgown to his so he wouldn't leave me. So my, my uncle and my grandmother were a very big part of my life. Um, my father was busy working. Mother did not. What she did your father do? My father is a tailor, and he had, in those days, I guess, that was the norm, to have a factory inside your own apartment. So he had a factory, and, and he had people working in the apartment. It was, I guess, after I was born that things became a little easier financially for them, and he was becoming 
more and more successful. And he was quite successful towards the end, just before the war. What else do you remember doing as a little girl in that house? Well, <coughs> um, I remember there were always a lot of people coming around. Uh, my parents were very active in the drama group and choir, and they always tell me that they performed in the Ida Kaminski Theater. So they were quite an artistic bunch that used to come up. And I was the only child of that whole group. So there was a lot of attention lavished. I mean, they taught me a lot of things. And um, I what? guess one of them was performing for them, you know. After the war, one of them found us. And he was, he was so excited. All he could keep saying was, Dina, it is you. Dina, it is you. Dina, it is you. And I was like nine years old. And he couldn't believe that that little girl of two was now nine and survived the war. Did they teach you songs? Or oh, yes, yes. Do you remember any of them? There was one that I remember, but it's in Polish, and I don't remember the whole thing, but it used to go something like... Uh, Puchu, puchu, class to class to, nie mam rączek jedenastu, tylko mam dwie rączki małe, do pracenia doskonale. <laughs> That's the one I remember. <laughs> uh, the, the years before the war um, are very vague, as I said, just fragments, because when the war broke out, uh, I was two. Any memories with your mother? Yes. What I do remember is parks with my mom. Mom would take me to the park and she'd feed me all sorts of stuff and we'd go and see the geese in the Krasinski Okrut in Warsaw, Poland. So, and I, I guess over the years, you know, from that time on, she and I were very, very close. Uh, sometimes she used to you know, <laughs> in my later years, I guess, um, she was a little difficult, but uh, always, always bright, always forthright, and a lot of the times demanding. <laughs> Do you remember how you learned that uh, there was a war? Well, <clears throat> with the first bombing of Warsaw, and when would that have been? That would have been September 1, 1939. All the people, and we lived in a very Jewish concentrated area of Warsaw. Uh, the sirens came about. Everybody went outside and stood in the gates. The buildings were gated, a courtyard gated, and in, inside that courtyard there were all sorts of uh, apartment buildings. The bombing started, and I do remember, I don't remember the danger of it, but I do remember the uncomfort of it and being in my mother's arms. And the bomb started to fall, and the building started to collapse. And the police would not let people out of the gates because there were fires, there were sirens, there were horses, there were fire brigades, and those were the days of the horse and buggy. So, with the pressure, I suppose, people, people just broke out of the gates and started running. And mother, carrying me, ran a whole day and into the night. And it was quite late at night with running. She, I don't know how she encountered one of her the friends who rescued us and took us into a basement. This was still in Warsaw? That was the very first day of bombing of Warsaw, September 1. So when your mother was running back and forth, it was within Warsaw? It was within that Warsaw. Yeah, masses were running. Uh, people were running in one direction and encountered other people running towards them who stopped them and said, don't run any further because such and such a street is burning. So you make another turn and other people keep come running and saying, don't go any further, we were just there. This street is burning. It was chaotic. It, it must have been something incredible. I, it's like a dream. I cannot tell you exactly 
I wish mom were here. She would describe it very, very eloquently. The next morning, everybody congregated in their own homes to see who, what, how survived because in this rush and panic, my father, my uncle, my grandmother, and mother all dispersed in different directions. So in the morning, my mother tried to make her way, and it wasn't an easy thing because there were barricades. Streets were crowded with dead horses and wagons overturned and cars and people, mostly people, dead people. My father and my uncle got back to our house before, and since they didn't see mother, the two of them ventured out into the streets, turning over every dead woman and child to see if it was my mother and I. I'm sure it must have been great joy for them to encounter one another again. After that, we had no home. I don't know what span of time, you know, whether it was the same day, whether it was a few days later, whether they were able to uh, collect some of their belongings, if anything was left. But what I do remember is that we went outside of Warsaw to uh, a village called Drogichin nad Bugiem, near the Russian border, where my mother and I used to vacation summer times and where her family lived. Who in her family lived there? She had uh, cousins, and they lived there all year round. And we used to come there to vacation in the summertime. So we went there, as this was still, from what we understood, standing still and was not bombed as yet. Who knew what was going on? I don't imagine my mom and dad even suspected what would happen. So mom, grandmother rather, didn't want to go, and neither did my uncle Saul. So the two of them stayed in Warsaw, but my father, mother, and I we went on to the family. We were there quite a few months. I'm not quite sure what length of time, during which time my mother was deathly ill. She was hospitalized. I was very ill. What illnesses? My mother had diphtheria, and then I got that. And uh, she... Uh, she came out of the hospital and with diphtheria, you really have to watch your diet, I think. And her cousin was making fresh chicken livers with onions. And although the cousin didn't want to give it to her, that's the story that I got, Mom had very good persuasive powers, and she had some. And that night they had to call the doctor because and the doctor said, either she's going to die or she's going to make it. You know, there's nothing to do. And thankfully, Mom had a good constitution, and she made it through. And uh, later on, when the Russians came, everybody left. Everybody was evacuated out of there. I think you told me you also had scarlet fever. Was that at that time? No, the scarlet fever was later on when we left Siberia en route to Tashkent. That uh, from, from this Drogichi nad Bugem, they took us to Archangel. Tell and me about that. Well, then, you know, it becomes a little clearer the picture because then I was already, uh, I don't know, maybe three and a half, four, you know. So we went to um, Archangel. There were cars were provided, cattle cars were provided, and all the people on the Russian border, Russia, Poland, were evacuated to Siberia. The and car cattle cars were provided by by the Russian government. And um, after three or four weeks in those, we wound up on. I think it must have been the White Sea because uh, Archangel is on the White Sea. What's your <coughs> understanding of why they evacuated you and to there? From what I understand was that Russia, Poland at that time did not enjoy 
very friendly relations. The Polish government was exiled to London, England at the onset of the war. And it wasn't until the treaty, I think it was in 1941, but I'm not quite sure of my history dates, that the uh, Russian and Polish governments had um, a treaty that the Polish citizens residing in Russia from the time that they were evacuated, from the time of the war 1939, were allowed to leave that area and settle in other cities in Russia other than capital provincial cities. So we were in Archangel 14 or 17 months, during which time my father, and we were as prisoners there because um, you, you couldn't go, you couldn't leave the place. First of all, where it was. <laughs> And secondly, if you left, you know, you, you had to have transportation. You couldn't, either you went into the ocean or you went into the forest. Neither one of them gave you a very good choice because if, if you didn't have transportation, you were lost. Do you remember anybody trying to escape? No, I don't, especially not from the Jewish community that was there. So there were was Jewish and non-Jewish prisoners? Originally there was a prison. And it was a Russian prison of many years in existence. And we were sort of the addition to that, to that area. How many of you approximately were there? I couldn't tell you, but there must have been at least 10, 14 villages. And they were called the Pasholik. And each Pasholik had a number rather than a name. Pasholik number one, Pasholik number two. Um, after the war, we met a lot of people who were Pasholik number six, Pasholik 23, Pasholik 14, you know. And you were? Number one. Uh, that's when my mother, there was a hospital there. My mother worked in the hospital. My father worked um, with the horses. He was grazing the horses at night. I should speak to dad about his experiences with the bears and the wolves, how they came around, and how he had, was responsible for the horses. Uh, sometimes he had to deliver things from one posholic to another. And the frost was like 56 below centigrade. We're not talking, not pretty cold. Paper to wrap around your feet, things to keep you warm. And mother worked in the hospital. What did she do there? She was a nurse, with no nursing <laughs> experience. She was a nurse. And uh, when my father was uh, working at night, raising the horses, then I would go with her to the hospital and stay there because it was very close to the house. In those days, my mother was the frightening one. My father was the brave one. So I, at the age of four, used to hold her hand and take her to the hospital. In later what years. else do you remember doing as a little girl in Arkansas? Amnem Pasholik? Uh, I remember having an infection. Um, in one of those trips with my mother, I somehow infected my right thumb. And um, there was um, blood poisoning setting in. And my father to get the doctor. The doctor wasn't there, so they got a, so they got a, a vet who okay, came and with a pair of pliers that I remember so vividly tore off the nail. And that probably saved my life. And uh, sitting on my father's lap while this was done, I had very devoted parents. I mean, they, they really, they really showed their emotions towards me, you know. Um, I used to be envied by my friends, you know, but I always knew, they always knew that my mom and dad loved me a great deal. It was a good feeling. It's a good feeling. Tell me about other children, friends in Archangel. At that, in, in Archangel, I do not remember in having friends or, and I didn't, don't even know if there were other people with children. Life was very segregated. Uh, 
you had your little house, which consisted of a room, um, your, your immediate family, things were fairly secretive. I do not recall having a social life, not just for myself, but for my parents as well. Did you have contact with the outside world, newspapers? None at all. None at all. Did you see books? Nothing at all. This was not, this was not a place where people uh, lived a normal life. I don't know what went on like in the prison where the, the Russian prisoners were, but on that posholik itself, I don't recall ever having books or radio, um, newspapers, uh, some sort of communication even with other people, I don't recall. But I do recall that just that hospital and where it stood, it's, it's a vision that stands in front of my eyes, the forest where it was in proportion to our house. And um, the life that went on there, um, food. What food? A lot of mushrooms. <laughs> a lot of mushrooms. Mother learned how to um, how to pick the mushrooms because there were many incidences of uh, poison mushrooms and fruits. Uh, berries. There were a lot of berries. And during the winter months, it was lean pickings. Do you Very remember being hungry? In those days, yes. Uh, after that, I I don't remember hunger to the point of um, suffering, prolonged suffering. I don't. I do know that my father, when we first landed in, in the Pasholik, in that area, um, being not citizens of that area, but just being guests of cousins, and when we were taken away, we had nothing to take with us. But the people who lived there, they took whatever products they had to take with them. And when the train stopped, they took some wood and stones and started to cook a little bit this, that, and the other. And my father went around with a cup begging a spoonful from each whoever cooked for his child. They didn't have anything. I'm sure mom and dad were very hungry. But they did provide for me. You arrived in Archangel speaking Polish. Right. But not Russian? No. Russian was a foreign language, as was Yiddish. It was a foreign language. All those languages <laughs> came later. <laughs> you learned Russian? I learned Russian there I st in, in Archangel. I started. So I guess there must have been some contact with Russian people, whether it was people who came into the house or whether it was some contact. I don't recall. But when we left Archangel and eventually settled in on, on a kalhoz, I attended school. Tell me about leaving Archangel. Well, whatever reason was when we left, I, I think it was when the Polish uh, government did have that treaty with the Russian that they let the Polish citizens go. And again, the Russian government provided uh, cattle cars, and all the people left. And after being in Archangel in Siberia, this cold, 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 frozen world, I think that Shalon was headed for Asia. Tashkent, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. And most people reached those places because there were a lot of Jews there afterwards. Unfortunately, I got ill. En route. What happened? Uh, I had scarlet fever and uh, we had to leave the Shalon in Ulyanovsk. Ulyanovsk. And we left there and uh, my father found by some fluke a doctor who took me into a hospital, saved my life. My mother uh, stayed with me. Father left to try and find some work, to try and find some accommodations. People were dropping left, right, and center, dying. 
when I got out of the hospital, or uh, my father returned from where he found a job, he came back. From what he tells me, he did not recognize mother. In the two week or three weeks span, she had become totally emaciated. She sold her clothing, she sold her coat to get orange to bring me to the hospital. She ate the peel, I ate the orange. So um, when my father returned, she was quite a sight. And then they took us, you know, my father took us to where he had found a job, which as I said, it was an Akalhoz. So just in Ulyanovsk, you stayed just during the time you were in hospital? That's right. How long would that have been? I think I was in the hospital for three weeks, possibly a little longer. Uh, it took a little while till I got into a hospital. Um, there were children. There were so many children. The, as the shalons were passing, when you ask, they, uh, children were taken off. The ones who were sick, there was a lot of whooping cough that I remember. Uh, being taken, children were taken out to the balcony you know, in a building that had no roof or had no walls, you know. Um, I was lucky. I was just one of the lucky ones that uh, my father did recognize a doctor and uh, with I his believe your father told me it was a doctor he had known. From Poland, yes. He recognized him on a street walking behind him. He ran after him, kept calling doctor, doctor. And the man turned around and he said, how did you recognize that I was a doctor? And uh, my father told him by his clothing, <laughs> being a tailor, paid off. <laughs> and he told him that he has a little girl who's, who's very ill and could he help? And just by fluke at that time, that particular Polish doctor was opening up a clinic for con uh, infectious diseases for children. And uh, he came to the hospital with a wagon to get me, and my mother had to keep the nurses busy while they stole me out of the hospital and put me into the clinic, and that was my saving grace. So um, I did get better, and then my father came. We're going to take a short break. Oh, terrific. I How was old? four. Four years old. Around four. What do you remember? I remember the house that we lived in. It had red painted floor. It was a fair size room. Uh, it had a table, two beds. It had a Dutch oven with a little place to go in. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> and it had an entry room earth floor. The door was um, um, with straw and burlap to keep the warmth. Uh, in the winter time, the snow was so bad that it covered up the windows. I remember my sled, which was <laughs> a round bowl filled with ice, froze overnight. And in that entry room, we had a goat. We had a goat, and her name was Katya. Like all the goats, her name was Katya. And at first, my mother, to identify this white goat, she made three marks with a pencil on her, uh, those ink pencils. In those days, we had ink pencils. You had to wet it in order to write ink. She marked it, three stripes. Just so happened that it rained. Couldn't find our Katya. And the uh, shepherd would come through the main road in the morning, and everybody let out their goats, cows, whatever, take this to the fields, and he would bring it home at night through the same route, and the animals knew which doors to go into. And Katya came home, and we kept Katya in that, in that entry room, and she wouldn't let herself be milked. So my mother would tie her horns very close to the wall, and she would push her right to the wall so she wouldn't turn over the bucket of milk. <laughs> And from that milk, my mother we made all sorts of things, so she learned how to do this. She was a city girl. She didn't know anything about these things, but she learned fairly quickly. 
and she made cheeses and she made kaffir and she made sour cream and she learned how to bake and then oh when after my father was gone she learned to bake from potatoes at least 40 different things just potatoes did you ever milk the goat oh yes i loved it i loved it i used to know <laughs> eventually katya became my goat but uh, but till then she was she was our main main source of protein so it was kind of nice to have Katya. It was it was fun, you know, as a child. We had a goat, we had a couple of chickens, you know, it was it was lively, you know, there was livestock around. And in those days my father was working in a in that job where he got the uh Meisterskaya, the the factory, the job, the the I guess it was a factory. And uh he because he was well liked and he was doing very well, we were fairly well provided. Um, in the Kalhoz, everybody has some land that you work for yourself. And then through trade, one way or the other, we had a little bit of flour and we had a little bit of uh, this, a little bit of that. For the winter, you put away your potatoes in this cellar, uh, cabbage, that sort of thing. We also had dandelions. We also had spinach growing wildly. So it was not too bad. Not, I had no comparison to make. Did you have uh, mm -hmm. other children to play with? In, uh, in, on the kolkhoz? Oh, yes. On the kolkhoz it was, I had friends. I had also some Jewish people, like friends. I have a friend living in Israel now that go back all the way back from that kolkhoz. And we went school to school together. Um, I had Russian friends as well. I started school. I also developed um, bronchial uh, problems and I had chronic bronchitis for five years. Tell me about school. What was school like? School? This was your first school. That was my first school. And school was great. I mean, I, I, li I loved school. It, it wasn't until I came to Canada that I realized that school is a different sort of thing than what we had in, in Russia. For one thing, in the wintertime, it was very cold. It wasn't heated. Or if it was, it was the pot belly in each classroom. We didn't have ballpoint pens. Can you imagine ballpoint pens? We had ink, and we had ink wells that froze, so you couldn't write. So what we used to do is, sitting in our coats and with our gloves on and boots, the violinki, uh, the, the desks were sort of slanted and they were dark, they were black, almost like a blackboard, and we did our problems, let's say, what we, whether it was in, in um, math or it was later on in, in uh, algebra. They start very early, things like that in Russia. Or to, to write whatever you had to write. With chalk on your desk. And was two students per desk. It was the longer ones, not the single ones. And this is how we did our uh, work at school because it was very cold. <laughs> very, very cold. You told me you were an excellent student. I liked school, yes. I liked school. I also had to join the Aktiabryonix, uh, which is the first stage in the Communist Party. As a schoolgirl, everybody had to, you know, all the girls, all the boys, and it's uh, the Aktiabryonix is the first. What were you required to do? Uh, just like scouts, I suppose. The only, you had to wear a white shirt with a red gulls. To, uh, Kerchief? Kerchief with that little emblem, and, you know, it was gatov, sigda gatov, you know, ready, always ready, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, that's where I had, of course, uh, made more friends. And it was, it was okay, it was okay, other than the odd time I was called Zhid, and there was this Zhid, Zhid, Navirjovic, Kibi Zhid, you know. Which and is? Not a nice word for Jew. Um, 
juju on a string, dancing on a string, or running on a string. Uh, but I was called a lot of times Ivrika, which is another word for Jewess. A politer form. A politer form. But I didn't know what made me different. Why did they call me Ivrika? I mean, I went to school, I lived in the same, I, I looked the same. It, it, there was there was no difference. Uh, my my Russian was perfect. I didn't know that I didn't know Russian. You know, I mean, it was everything was just great, and I couldn't understand why I was called Ivrika. And uh, there was this underlying accepted, not accepted, as part of a group. And I was growing. You know, I was five and six. And seven, you know, I mean, th this was uh, very formative years, and it was something that you feel very intensely as a child. I remember one time being called, and everybody had Christmas. I mean, Christmas was a big holiday. And we didn't celebrate Christmas, we didn't have a tree. And that made me different, okay? And the children said, You don't have a tree. Now, I had to go and ask my parents, what is this Jewess? And why don't we have a tree? And I remember one day being called in by a friend to their house to see the tree and to partake of their, their meal. And, um, having to, and they asked me to recite because I did like poems. And I, I recited for them poetry, Russian poetry. And, and you know, being applauded and, and uh, being accepted, I came away feeling so warm, you know, that I was accepted. By, but yet the next day, they'd call me Ivrika. Now, it just didn't make sense. Here you're accepted, the next day you're called Ivrika. What did your family, your parents, tell you about this when you asked? Uh, they told me it's not such a bad thing. The Ivrika, you're, you're a Jewess. Mother is Ivreka, Ya Ivre, I am a Jew, you know, we're all Jewish. No, listen, if my mom and dad are Jewish, that couldn't possibly be thought that bad for me. But I had no Jewish knowledge. I had no Jewish um, learning. I had no idea about this, none at all. Definitely nothing with religion. It wasn't until my father was imprisoned and we lost that house, we were made to move, that um, we had to find lodgings. So we had to go to another part of this village, and we had to wait until the cow had the calf, and then the people took the calves into their homes, into their, into their homes. They used to take the, the baby livestock and whitewash this place and to remove all the manure and put in a table and a chair and a bed and moved into that place. So uh, we stayed there for a little while. Let uh, me just back up. You said, mentioned your dad being taken to prison. Uh, tell me about the circumstances. Uh, to the best what I recollect in the stories that I have heard, I of course I elaborated, of course. But at that time, all I know is, I came home from school one day, and I started to do my homework. And in the middle of the afternoon, my father came home with two Nkavede men. And he said to me in Yiddish, I'm leaving for 10 years. And they got very upset for him speaking Yiddish. He had to speak Russian to me. They searched the house. They went into um, sort of the potato cellar, went through the whole thing, and then they took him away. And he had forgotten his cigarette paper. And I ran after him down towards the river. It was a path. That's where they took him. And I called to him. He turned. I gave him the paper. He hugged me. He kissed me. And they left. And that was in 1943. It was what after month? that was in the summer months, uh, maybe June, maybe May, 
And what's your understanding of why he was arrested? Well, when we, when I ran to get my mother to tell her that they took away my father, with great panic and trepidation, she came home, and all of a sudden we found out that four other men, Jewish men, that were in the village, were also taken away. And later on they said that father and they were imprisoned for political reasons. So whatever political reasons in those days, which I understood later, didn't really have to be substantiated by anything. And they said that my father was a spy. And that's why they took him away. Uh, first of all, they kept him in the village there for a very short time. And then they sent them all away to Petropavlovsk, which is, again, in the northern part of Russia. And uh, my mother and a, a friend of hers, that little girl, that Rachel, my friend, uh, they each took turns looking after each other's child while one of them went to take care packages to uh, the prison. Uh, my father was interrogated for a long time, and he has some horrendous stories to tell. They wouldn't let him sleep. They would interrogate him through the night. They would interrogate him through the day. Uh, the beatings that he got, um, the sentencing that was that was a farce. Um, pretty horrendous stories he does tell. I believe your father will be interviewed on a, a different tape. Uh, was he, in fact, uh, involved in a political way? None of them were. We were so isolated from everything in the village. We had a radio, which consisted of a plate uh, at the corner in the room up near the ceiling. Whatever was broadcast, that's what you could hear. You had no choices. You had no dials. There was a newspaper. It was the Russian newspaper. We had no contact with other cities, no mail, nothing. We, d we didn't know what was going on in the world other than the war was going on. We, there was an army hospital in the, that uh, village, and it was, it was the Russians, the Russian soldiers. The stories that we heard were the Russian stories. How could my father have been politically involved? He never left the village for a minute. Nobody came. So it was just the five Jewish men, and all five of them were arrested. None of them came back except for my father. How he survived is sometimes, I, I listen to the stories, is beyond me. Tell me how life continued for you and your mother. Well, uh, we lived for a little while in that little house. My mother was an usherette by now. She had graduated to an usherette in the movie house wasn't the movie house as we know here. It was the big gathering hall with tables and chairs and uh, benches and whatever, a screen, and one of those pillars, which in the winter time, do I have to tell you, it kept breaking. That celluloid kept breaking. It took forever till it got fixed. And because there was no babysitter, I used to go to see all those movies. I think I mentioned to you that the first movie that I saw was Serenada Solnechnei Dalini. And I saw it again in Canada. I was flabbergasted. <laughs> Sun Valley Serenade. I couldn't get over that. Sonia Henny could speak English. <laughs> I was so sure that she was a Russian actress. So, and, and the words were translated. The songs were also, you know, in Russian. The Russians. Znayu ya ti, which was I know why and so do you, you know that song, and it was really interesting to see that such things happen. So um, I was there with mom most of the nights, but it really wasn't a very good thing to come home at two, three o'clock in the morning. I have to go to school, so we found an, another uh, Jewish family, and uh, it was a young man and his aging mother. He was not imprisoned. And uh, they moved in with us. We took a bigger room, 
bigger house, a bigger room, that's all it was. But it was really a bad one because I do remember getting dressed to go to bed. Getting dressed to go to bed, mittens, gloves, uh, a hat. Uh, the one thing that I do remember having when, oh, I should have told you this long time, was this Ibba bet. Do you know that I have two Eider down covers at the cottage made from that Ibba bed from 1939? It was life saving. In the morning, the water that I used to bring from the river for washing, for cooking, to get washed in, was frozen in the pail. The snow and the ice would come in between the bricks. Now, oh, that's another thing. Um, the houses were built out of a certain kind of brick. The brick was made in the summertime. It was made of manure, straw, and clay. And people would stomp like they do grapes in this thing. And then fill squares, so oh, let's say about maybe a foot by half a foot, some of them bigger, some of them smaller, and then put on an angle against the sun to dry. And as they dried, they shrank and they fell out of these things. This is what, what was built. And then they were whitewashed. Uh, then some of them were built out of logs and filled with that. Okay, now I don't have to tell you what happened to these houses in rains. They were incredible. That I do remember. And I do remember the snow and the ice on the inside of the walls. <laughs> That's pretty rough. So we lived with them. And that is where I first started learning about religion. This aging lady, she had a Bible. She had a, a sacred Torah with her. And she started to tell me stories. And I was mesmerized by them. I, I couldn't get the fill of her. And she would tell me stories in her, in her nice, soft Yiddish way. And she was like another grandmother. She would sit near the window and I'd sit at the stool and she'd tell me all sorts of stories. To me, they were stories. It wasn't religion. It was stories. And that was my first inkling of that. Uh, and that lasted till till after we we left. Um, what about Jewish holidays? Did you learn about them from her? Stories, but no observances. It w we we didn't observe. There wasn't even ten people to have a minion. I mean, now I work for a Jewish synagogue. I mean, and for a Holocaust Jewish synagogue to begin with, I can tell you all sorts about the holidays. In those days, I didn't know anything. Not until we came to Germany that that became clearer what Judaism holidays what was all about and in 1945 when the war ended again the, these cattle cars were provided and the Polish citizens who did not take the Russian passports out were allowed to leave Russia. Uh, the whole idea was that they kept offering to the Polish people um, to become Russian citizens. Some of them did. Some of them intermarried. And, and they had to stay. They stayed in, in Russia. But all those who did not take the, um, out the Russian citizenship, acquire passports, were permitted to leave Russia and go back to Poland. Now this shalom that we were on, headed for Poland, was destined for the Polish corridor, for the place that previously was Germany, and they wanted to settle with Polish citizens that part of previous Germany. And I can't remember how long, but it was certainly several weeks where we slept on straw and ate uh, whatever we could, and the cattle cars were also provided with uh, pot-bellied stoves. You know, it was fairly cold. 
and uh, we got as into Poland and my mother and her friend Tosha and Rachel and I and the four of us my mother jumped off the train when it hit Walbrzych that was already the last city before that Polish corridor uh, we got off and they took us off and we the train continued and we stayed in Walbrzych and that was revelation that was like being born at the age of nine it, it was stores with toys we played in Russia with broken china pieces you know the floral dishes and they had little little flowers on them broken pieces of china those were the toys and uh, collecting them you know and trading them <laughs> I mean that that was how, what other we used to put together like this the earth and make rooms in a house it wasn't anything tangible. It was just, you know, it came a window, you had no house, made it all over again, you know. But these were the toys. Here, walking on the street, running back and forth from side to side, not paying attention to cars, not paying attention to street cars. We didn't know what they were. And seeing food stores, or seeing, you know, meat hanging, cheeses looking in the window. Two wild Indians Two, what, our mothers couldn't contain us. We were. <laughs> you said that uh, bathrooms were quite exciting. Oh. We got, I mean, all this time in Russia. In Russia, you go behind the barn, or you make from the sunflower stalks. You know, in the summertime, you tie them together for a little privacy. We got an apartment. Um, in in Walbschach. and I thought they were really uncivilized. I mean, I really thought that was a that was that was the end. Can you imagine being too lazy to go outside? They had, they had special places in in the house, in the house. Magic with a turn of the hand, those switches where I remember with, you know, turning not up and down switches but with a turn of the hand. Lights came on. I do this with my grandchildren when they're about six months old, you know, maybe less. They know how to turn up and down the lights and they know what lights are. That this represents that. But we, we thought it was magic. Absolute magic. And you know what else they had? They had paper. Special paper in the bathroom. Was really till you learn what what these things are, how to go into a store to to shop, because my mother worked and she would leave me some money, and I would go for lunch, to buy my lunch, and with money I'd go in and I'd buy ten deka shinke, you know, or or a bun or whatever, and and that was that was unusual. Um, two things were very bad. One was incredible. In the bathroom of the apartment, we found soap. There were like the bars of soap that you use, lye or whatever, you know, for, for heavy duty soap, not facial soap. And it was RJF soap engraved in it. And it wasn't until later that we found out it was stood for Rhein Judenfett. That's when the whole picture started to unravel what did happen in our absence in Russia. We were not aware what was going on. But then we started to hear. People started to congregate, started to hear what really did happen and what this soap really meant. I cannot tell you what it does to your insides. I heard later on that a cousin of mine 
was killed by 17 Russians. After the war, way after the war, who accosted her and killed her, how many people were killed after the war when they returned to their homeland, Poland? We were among the lucky ones. Anyways, I started school there in Poland. You had said there were two things. One was the soap. And the other one was school. <laughs> now, by now, I knew that I was Jewish. Okay. Uh, I knew that we were different. And we went to school. Uh, excuse me. Um, school was uh, Catholic schools. I mean, uh, that is the um, religion of the country. Rachel and I were taken to school. And uh, every morning you had to stand up and, or kneel down rather and say, you know, to cross yourself. And I wouldn't. I'm going to interrupt you just at this point. Okay. We'll take a short break. Okay. So you were in school? So um, my mother would take me to school every morning. And every morning or afternoon or whatever time the teacher decided, I was thrown out of class. For not I kneeling not, down? Not kneeling down, not classing myself. So I would go to my, and Polish is another language. It's a different alphabet. It's a different, uh, my mother got beaten up in Russia for saying the word bilet instead of bilet. Uh, it's, some of the words are, are very similar, but there's still a difference. But reading and writing, it's a totally different story. So <clears throat> I started a new language and Polish. Polish was my first language, really. Uh, Russian came second then, so that came sort of easier to me. And uh, in no time at all, there was no problem with Polish. But the reading and the writing, of course, I needed that. And because they kept throwing me out of school, I kept going to my mother. My mother would bring me back the next morning. I would go to school. They'd throw me out. Same thing. It went on for a very long time. Until one day, my mother decided this was really foolish. And there was a parrot shuler in Weibschach, and she registered me in the Jewish school. So now came a third alphabet, and Yiddish. And that was another language altogether, <laughs> that was a foreign language. I started with that. Um, life sort of started to settle in. How did the Jewish kids accept you? Those children were the same children as I. I, I didn't feel as an outsider because there was no parent shuler before. Uh, we were among the first ones to return. Walbzich before then was in German hands. When it turned into Polish hands and the shule opened up and it was Jewish children. So I wasn't the outsider. I wasn't the new kid on the block. I was the same as everybody else. My girlfriend, Rachel, continued with the Polish school. She did kneel. She did stay. Ironically enough, she wound up in Israel, and I came to Canada. <laughs> Anyways, um, we were in, um, we had an apartment. My mother worked. Um, I went to school. But we did start hearing about the anti-Semitism and the pogroms. How did you hear? Newspaper which wasn't so much, but there was a Jewish life emerging again in Poland of the people who came from concentration camps, from hiding, from Russia, from um, different surrounding countries where they wanted to come back to, to their homeland. So a Jewish life started to emerge. And you can't help but hear all sorts of stories. Life was not what 
I guess my mother anticipated she'd be able to pick up <laughs> at a break, be able to pick up this and start all over again. It was different. Number one, she was a woman alone. We hadn't heard from my father from the time we left Russia. Although in Russia you were able to yeah. contact him. In Russia we were corresponding. I sent him pictures. He sent me letters. So oh, yes, even though he was very, very far away, letters did reach us and, and correspondence did go on. As a matter of fact, um, my mother had written to dad that we would not leave Russia until he was freed. The reply came that he would feel a lot better knowing that we were back home meaning Poland, but we didn't know what to expect. So up until that point, correspondence was going on. After that, there wasn't any. So um, when these pogroms started and the danger again loomed for Jewish people and a woman alone with child and this um, uh, Zionistic movement reaching the people who had survived Palestine, homeland, that sort of thing. Um, and there were means and ways of reaching um, places from which you could go to Palestine. Um, we left with a group of 30 people, Valbshek, one night packed in the middle, no forwarding addresses, um, with a group walking um, to a certain point. There was a cart for a certain point. After that, you had to continue walking. And uh, we reached Czechoslovakia. Uh, we were there for a short time. No school, no just sitting waiting until the next lap of the journey could take place. Again, secretively, nighttime, with leaders from Israel helping these people to reach certain collective points. Ours was eventually Germany, and we settled in uh, on the U.S. zone, Ulm, Ulm and Donau, and in that city there were five um, camps for displaced people. We were in Sedan Caserne. Did your mother ever think of going elsewhere in Poland to be near her family or your father's family? Well, when we, when we came back to Poland, the Red Cross was very, very instrumental in trying to find people and making connections of families. And there were none left from her family. There were none at that point left from my father's family. There was a tribe. It wasn't just a family, it was a tribe. Uncles, aunts, great aunts, cousins, great cousins, you know, it was a it was a whole connecting chain of people that were related. Have you learned since anything about their fate? Yes, they all perished. They all perished. Uh, my father has a branch of the family that's in Israel. Mother's family, the only two were the, now it's their offsprings, but a sister and a brother who emigrated to the United States before my mother was born. And my father's one brother who was, came here before the, before the war. While in Germany, again, through newspapers, my mother found my father's brother, Uncle Saul. He was at that time with a kibbutz in Germany, residing um, on a farm near Frankfurt am Main. Uh, the farm had originally belonged to Streicher, and it was a fabulous, it was an incredible farm. And that's where the, the kibbutz took that over until they, it was their turn to go to Israel. But when we came, and I would imagine must have been at least two years since we had heard from, from my father. None of the other women, by the way, I heard from their men either. That my mother wrote a letter to my dad. 
She wrote the letter in Yiddish. She told them where we are, what has happened. And of course, she put on the return address. U.S. Zone, Germany. The letter came to the prison. They couldn't read the letter. However, they did see U.S. Zone, Germany. And what better proof did they have that he was politically involved? So they started interrogations all over again. What has he got to do with the Russians? What has he got to do with the Germans? What has he got to do with the Americans? Proof that he was spy. Now, my father never got the letter. He never had a chance to tell them what the letter was, nor did he have an inkling that this letter was sent to him by his wife, who was now in Germany. From what he understood, we were in Warsaw, back home. And we were in Germany. Now, that must have been late 46, 47. I started school. Now, uh, there were, eventually there were about 10,000 people in Ulm, maybe more, and among them there was a quite a number of children of all ages, different countries, different backgrounds. What and proportion of Jews? And no common language. Now, the purpose of these people in, um, in Germany was a concentrating point from which to take off for Palestine, new homeland. So Israel sent in Shrifim, um, and they opened up schools. And school was conducted very, very intensely in Hebrew, everything in Hebrew. You were penalized for speaking any other language but Hebrew. And now you started school in Hebrew. Okay, alphabet. Okay, I had from my Yiddish shula. Abba, Ima, you know, study. <laughs> starting all over again. So, <coughs> but I felt pretty good about it because everybody else was in the same boat. Uh, they grouped children, not according to age, but according to knowledge. Um, because I started my schooling in Russia, and they, they do have a very good schooling. They really do. Uh, I was with children a lot older than I because um, I was fairly good at school. And Hebrew, I liked. I also liked uh, learning about my religion, my background, my history. And I also liked, of course, the, the continuation of algebra and physics. And we used to live next door to the, to the teacher. I used to walk with him back and forth to school, and he would, he would talk about this, these subjects that he was crazy about. And he really instilled a great deal of liking for those subjects. And I have found that if you like the teacher, you do well in that subject. I really did like it. And you did well. And I did well. And Hebrew was, was where I started, and, and I learned Hebrew and in a three-year period. All the kids did. Our communication was in Hebrew. In the meantime, my father was released from prison. He didn't know that he was being released. He was just put in on a train, and when the train got to Warsaw, he saw that there were no more guards. And he looked around, and he could come and go. He got off the train in Warsaw. Through the Red Cross, he found out that we were in Walbrzych, and he was helped to get to Walbrzych, he looked for us, yes, there was, 
Hinda Denderovic, Dina Denderovic, in, in, uh, in what happened to them, nobody knows. You don't leave a forwarding address when you go that route. He was without funds. He was gaunt, clean shaven, you know, they had no hair. And when you have a trade in your hands, you have, you have a way of helping yourself, which he did. And he became a tailor, and he was working for a tailor store, factory, whatever you have you. Now, this was 47, maybe early 48. I'm trying to tell two stories, you know, simultaneously. But he was Seven. working in Walpschich? In Walpschich, in a store. We were in Germany and Ulm. Now, this is three years after the war. Most people began to look human. And most people in the camps, especially the young men, tried to advance in life accumulate a little funds because that was the thing that helped them. And one young man was smuggling the borders, Poland, Germany, Poland, Germany, and while he was in Poland decided to have a suit made. And he came into the store where my father worked. He looked a little odd, my father, because as I said, he had just come out of Russia, and they struck up a conversation. Where does a Jew come from? And um, my father said he was just released from, from Russia. Do you have family? He said, yes. He had a wife and a daughter. He doesn't know where they are. Valbzik was the last point, but he doesn't know where they are now. And as he was talking to him, he took out a picture from his breast pocket and showed him a picture of me that I had sent to him, still in Russia. And the young man looked at this picture, and he said, is her name Dina? And my father said, yes. He said, you know, I know her well because she's a girlfriend to my niece, and they live in Ulm, in Germany. And that's how we found my father. And my father wrote right away, and it took some time because by now it was not so easy, and the, the Israeli brigade or what have you was not so easily available to, to transport people and have the routes, you had to pay a guide. So between mom and dad working, they combined enough money to pay someone to guide my father over. And he joined us in, um, he joined us the end of 40, no, beginning of 49, I guess, um, in the winter time of 49 is when he joined us in Germany. And then, of course, his younger brother. You, know. you told me that the letter from your father arrived. Yes. Yes, it's Bashert, I suppose. Uh, now, 1947-48 were not very good years for Israel. Uh, War of Independence. And we got, of course, news and in newsprint and in, in the news in general, what was going on with ships that were trying to land in Palestine still, send, being sent back to Cyprus, conditions on Cyprus. And people who survived the war, and especially a woman alone with a child, uh, mom was not exactly ready to go and start a new war. So um, in some ways we, the papers were made out and, and demands were made and we had an opportunity to go to Argentina. And we were to take the afternoon train for Bremenhof to board a ship for Argentina. And the letter from my father came that morning. And my mother said to me, what would you like to do? What do you think we should do? I don't know what kind of a morning it was. Maybe I was a little upset with her that day. <laughs> like my grandson says to me, it's not a good day for me. 
so uh, I said I want my father. And uh, of course we waited. And dad came. And uh, again we had to start with papers, you know, for um, for uh, Canada where his brother was from before. His younger brother was here by now too. And uh, in August 14th, August 14th, we arrived in Canada via SS Black. And uh, that was it. We arrived in the Golden Medina, Canada. Um, by now, I was 12. Uh, we arrived on a Sunday. And on Monday, my father had a job as tip-top tailor. Took my mother a little longer till Wednesday. And she went to work for Paragon, I think, or some other company sewing purses. And this was August, so I waited a couple of weeks and I started school. Now we started English. So I come into class. And I did understand Miss Breckenridge was my teacher, and she was my son's teacher in grade six in parochial school afterwards. It was really something. But um, she said, alphabet. Alphabet is alphabet, there's no problem. Now, it looked like the Polish alphabet to me, so I stood up and I said, A, B, Z, B, G, H, I, J. And the class really made fun of me. Oh, they made fun of me. But there were other there were three other children in my class with the same I bet said there. <laughs> so uh, we sort of stuck together and when you're a youngster you learn fairly quickly and uh, came English. Um, that was forty nine. Um, we rented a flat. I'm trying to think, you know, what it, how the, mm -hmm. the sequence of events. I made friends with my cousin. I had a cousin. I had two uncles now. I had two aunts. I mean, I'm, the family was expanding. Um, we had uh, family reunions. It was bonding because these were, you know, strangers really to me. Uh, that first Sunday, that was really something. Uh, foods that I had never seen before, and I love them. Like what? Smoke fish and lux and Cisco and herring. <laughs> Things are really great. Herring I knew, but not the kinds of herrings that they had. I was, my aunt had prepared a real feast for when uh, we landed. Well, we landed in uh, in Halifax. It took I've got to tell you this story. Um, shortly before we were leaving for Canada, when we knew we were going to Canada, my parents decided I better learn English. Maybe three weeks before. Now, how much can you learn in three weeks? Okay. So we land in uh, Halifax. Everybody gets off the boat. There's a train waiting. Everybody rushing to, you know, we also rushed. We went into, into a compartment. We sat down. Came a conductor. Said a few things in English. My parents said, what did he say? What did he say? <laughs> said, I don't know. <laughs> we gave him the, pa the, you know, not passports, but the landing card. He gave it back. He was quite upset. It took a few tries until somebody came along and explained that this compartment was not for immigrants, so we had to leave and go to another one. <laughs> it's like, quick, teach me English. So <coughs> we came to Canada. It was, took us three days, and we, we got to uh, Union Station, and it was a family welcome, and several taxis were waiting, and up University Avenue, which isn't exactly as it is now. In those days, there were big mansions. There was a, a large synagogue. I mean, 
synagogue. I mean, that was really something to see the synagogue. Had you ever been in a synagogue? No. no. That was my, my first even uh, sight of what a synagogue and what it means to, or supposed to mean to me, a synagogue was. Did you have some uh, Jewish education here in Canada? No. Uh, from from uh, formal education in, in no. Uh, I did belong to the um, uh, Shomer Hatzair. I went back to the Shomer Hatzair because that was my uh, introduction yes. to Zionism in Germany. Yes, we missed talking about that. In Germany, you joined Shomer Hatzair, and yes. we're going to see some pictures of you right. there. Right, my, my groups, yes. Tell me about your activities. Uh, you know, I know that when, when you're trying to explain something, it's one thing, but with words come emotions. So now I was not Ifreka. Now I was one of. I mean, and the whole idea, that whole spirit of being in Germany was, we're going to Israel, we're going to Palestine, and Zionism, was an introduction via which this, this this whole thing is going to come about. And it was really great, a feeling that, that all of a sudden you are no longer that outsider looking in. Now you are a part of. Everybody was Jewish in the camps. Everybody was a survivor of one sort or another. Everyone was going to fight for Israel and have an independent land. Did you imagine your life in Israel? But of course, I didn't imagine. I was told exactly what my life was going to be. What was that? I was going to fight. I was going to have a, a training with, with guns, and, and uh, I was going to be a, a very intact I was going to be a very integral part of winning this, this war, and I was going to be part of Israel. And, of course, Kamatov Lichyot Shomer Hatzair. I mean, there was a song. Do you know that song? Do you know? Kamatov Lichyot Shomer Hatzair. Hashomer Hatzair. Hashomer Hatzair. Kamatov Lichyot Shomer Hatzair. Babuker Abuda Potsray Abuda Baerev. Menucha. You don't know that song? That was the, the Shemer Hatzair song. I mean, that's exactly it. How good it is to be a Shemer Hatzair. In the morning you work, in the afternoon you eat, and in the evening you rest, and you know, that's, that's it. So that was really pretty good. When I came to Canada, not speaking the language, um, not knowing, I mean, children my age were young ladies. I came with two big braids. I was a little girl in, in, by the standards of what, 12-year-olds in those days. So I looked for my own. And I found on, on Melrose or on Beatrice Street, I think it was on Beatrice Street, in, some, in a basement, was the Shomer Hatzair. Uh, we didn't jig a jerbug, we, we danced the hora. And that was a great thing that I found them. And we didn't have all the other things, you know, the trimmings that other kids did, you know, with the saddle shoes, with the jeans rolled up with the big pins, you know, with that little scarf and the thing. So I wore my father's pants with seven belts, you know, to keep it up. <laughs> but that was, that was nice. That was nice having that. And we, we stayed, stayed together as friends over all these years. Did at that point, did you still think you would go to Israel? Uh, in the beginning, yes. You know, the Shomer Hatzair and the Zionist, you know, yes. Um, I was quite upset that I was not going to, that I didn't wind up in, in Israel because that's the Halut spirit, that, that, that was what sustained, that's what we were. Um, but don't forget, very shortly after that, I met my future husband. 
I was 13 when my parents brought him home. And for the next uh, three years, uh, he came home to our house and he sat and watched the round television that we had with it with my father when I said and did homework. I mean, I, I didn't know that anything about marriage or anything. The last thing on my mind. Uh, but uh, eventually, of course, that's what happened. And uh, I married. And uh, straight out of high school. And I worked for some total of three, six months. Three months before the wedding, then I got married. Three months after the wedding, I became pregnant, and my husband, by the old standards, our wife does not work. What will people say? I can't support her. So I stayed. My parents and my husband bought a house together on Mount Royal, and I was supposedly the madame at home, but it wound up. I did the cooking, the washing, the cleaning for everybody. <laughs> We're going to take a short break. All right, so now so we're in Canada. And you had a baby, and I had a baby, and then I had another baby, and then I had another one. Then I had, so Tell me I the names of your children. My son, Richard, uh, he was born June 24, 1954. Uh, he is uh, married now, of course, and has children of his own, a set of twins. Ethan and Matthew, and they are now six and a half. Uh, in 1956, I gave birth to my daughter Anita. She was born August 29th, and she too is married. She's a director of uh, BC Hydro. By the way, Richard is an architect, and his wife Carla, she's a lawyer. Great, great people. Uh, my daughter is absolutely fabulous and she's married to David and they have a little boy Michael and Michael was two July the 15th just recently uh, in 1956 July the 2nd my third child my son Jeffrey was born uh, Jeffrey is uh, a mathematician or graduated in mathematics and he's married to Wendy, and they have three children. They have Jason, who, is, uh, who was born March 21st, 1990, and in 91, I think, came along Emily, and in 96 came along Noah. And in, on April 5th, 1963, my daughter Lisa was born, and Lisa is now married to Larry Rothman, and they have a little boy called Jake, who is as red as they come, and has the most smiling face you have ever seen. And um, I'm just a lucky, lucky, lucky lady in that respect. I have eight wonderful children and seven grandchildren. The sad mm -hmm. part is that. Uh, I lost my mother uh, just this year. She died uh, January the 18th, 1996. But I have my dad. And uh, I have a good support system. I've got wonderful friends. Not very many, but the ones that I have are salt of the earth. And I work. Um, I've done a lot of things in my time in Canada, from uh, selling shirts and ties to managing the first salon at Holt Renvoo in Vancouver, to doing uh, catering, to um, being an importer of costume jewelry, and then I went back to school, and now I work for the Lodger Center Holocaust Congregation. When you think back over the events that we've heard about, how do you feel they've directed your life? Uh, 
one does not reach now here without having to take a long journey from there and then. Um, for a long time, I did not want to be identified. I wanted to push it away. I didn't want to make it me and mine. It took a while. Um, I have volunteered in many areas, a uh, uh, member of Hadassah to help Israel. If for Israel I always worked, and um, in the beginning I was losing the language. So uh, my, my um, contact with the language was through records. And, um, and then of course I met people from Israel, I went to Israel many times and we captured uh, this wonderful language. Um, and there is a feeling of belonging that is so great and such a comfort that you work for that. Um, I don't often allow myself to think what has happened to the warriors. They sad me terribly. You know, one never knows what one's life would have been like. The opportunities, the chances, maybe not the chances. And what has happened to the people that were my family. We never um, were left with just a handful. Can you imagine? My mother had nine brothers and sisters, my father five. Just from that branch, how many people would be mine? Right. Now, my story is not a horrendous one. Surviving, how we survived, probably my parents would have been able to tell you uh, more meaningful things because they were adult and they knew a difference. I didn't know. You can only tell how bad things are when you are able to compare. I couldn't. Uh, but I have heard stories and these are my people. How has it affected your view of human nature, of, of people generally? For a long time I didn't want to be together with those people. <laughs> those people being? People who could have orchestrated such a holocaust, such a life. And people, individuals also, who did not extend a helping hand. Do you mean people in Poland or Germany? I mean Russia, Poland, Germany, even Canada, even some among our own. It was incredible, R really incredible. When we came to Canada in 49, it's not the same as people immigrate now to Canada. There was no assistance of any kind that you can see now. Now you, education is provided, housing is provided, health care is provided. Uh, um, there is a, a Jewish community to go into who view the survivors in a different light than what they did then. What did you have? When we came, it, a, it was very difficult to find a place to live. Uh, Why? With children, with children you weren't allowed. You know, that they, they didn't want to rent. Uh, you were the outsider again. There was no uh, relationship, co-relationship between Jews that came were fortunate enough to come to Canada before the war and those who have survived. You didn't feel a part of the Jewish community here? I felt that only a Jewish community of the Jews who came to Toronto after the war, survivors. And they congregated together. If you were to go on for a walk between Bathurst and Spadina, 
on a Sunday afternoon, you would meet everybody that you knew in, uh, in Toronto who came to, to here. Nobody had telephones. You couldn't use a telephone if you rented the flat. And they, they perpetuated their way of life before the war where you went for a promenade and you met people and you stopped in and you didn't call to say, uh, come on Tuesday afternoon at 3 o'clock for a cup of coffee. If you wanted to see a friend, you popped in to see your friend. It was just fine. That was fine. You didn't have to make any special arrangements. Now, if you tell anybody, um, why don't you come by, it's not an invitation. The invitation is specific time, specific day, you, you prepare. You do. It's a different way. It's a different way. One is not better or worse than the other, but this is how life is. Um, but the people, and I've seen it in my parents, my parents and I belong to the Workman's Circle. There is a branch made up specifically of the new immigrants to Canada. They too were not integrated into the Workman's Circle. Okay. Um, Camp Youngveld, or rather Nyveld, Youngveld, sorry, Nyveld is someplace else. Camp Youngveld was part of the Workman's Circle. It was a colony you know, where they have cottages. Well, in those days, the colony belonged to prominent workmen's circle, people who were here from a long time. Yeah. So among our own, there was also this, this difference that, that you could see. If you think of people watching this tape in the future, perhaps your grandchildren, great-grandchildren, what would you hope they would learn? I've thought about it a long time, um, not just for this interview. There was a point in time that I wasn't feeling well and I wanted to be sure. What would I like to leave for my grandchildren? I don't mean a Persian carpet or a diamond. Well, you know, the White Arm no longer here. They would think and relate. You know, what could I tell them to uh, of some significance that they would and there are only very few things. Number one, love one another, help one another, be bonded. That's important. Seek people who are people for the sake what's in their heart, not what's in their pocket. And help wherever you can. I think they'll have rich lives if they do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's me. Um, must have been, I don't know, maybe a year and a half. It would have been 1938. And uh, that would have been in Warsaw. Yeah. I had blonde hair. This picture was taken in the summer of 1939. Uh, that was just before the war, but in the summertime we went to the country in Drogichin nad Bugim. On the left and on the right of me are my mother's cousins, the ones that we stayed with uh, just before, the, uh, when we first came to Drogichin after the bombing. And the man standing is the husband of the one on the left. Right? We stayed with them. That is me and when we first came to Germany after the war. And um, as you can see, I still have the, my long braids and my mother's pride and joy. I was the only one in uh, Chilnevyoshine in Russia with long hair. My mother took excellent care of my hair because if anyone found lice, they were shaven right in the middle of the head. So I kept my long hair and they could smell me coming with the kerosene right through my school days in Russia. But I kept my long hair, my mother's pride. That's a group picture of my um, Shomer Hatsair days in, in Germany. 
uh, I am on the top row with the hair, sort of a crown in the hair. Um, and the bottom, uh, there's my teacher, one of the teachers. And um, the her name? I can't remember her name. Rachel, I think it was Rachel. And the one next to her was Ashalia from Israel, who came to see how the school was going. And the rest of them are all. Um, I am just to the left of uh, the boy in the middle row, on top of, you know, on the top row. So you're to the left of them again, David. Right. That's me. Um, I can tell you where, you know, if I had a closer look, but this is my whole Shomer Hatzair group in Sedan Kaserne Ulm. And this picture was taken on the beginning or the spring of 1948 with all the, the whole camp. I am in there someplace, just exactly where uh, from this distance I can't tell you. This is the group in which you were a leader? Yes, I was a leader of the very youngest. My mother uh, thought it was very great, but when we had meetings in the evenings, she came, she would come running, and she, she embarrassed me so by saying, how can you keep out children at this hour? And I thought I was so grown up. So, May 14th, 1948, the very, very first Yom Ha'atzma'ut, and that's my mother and I. Uh, this picture was also taken at the same time um, in 1948. That's again one of the shlichim that came. Uh, I'm on the left, and on the right is Tsipora, and Tsipora's uncle was the one who uh, said he knew me when he visited uh, Walbzich, when he saw Poland. And who actually identified? Who identified me in, from the picture that my father showed him. Uh, that was her uncle, Zipporah's uncle. But this picture was taken in Russia, my mother and I. Um, from th this picture is my mother and I, and then at the same time was taken an another picture, just I, that I sent to my father and that he had um, shown to that man who uh, identified me and came from Germany. And this must have been taken in 1945, probably. This photo was taken in 1949, just before we came to Canada. And that's my father who joined us, uh, my mother and I. That's my son Richard and his wife Carla. Um, this was taken at uh, the wedding of uh, his sister Anita. So. Uh, they were attendants. Those are their sons. Matthew is on the left. Ethan is on the right. They are now uh, six and a half. And they're the children of Richard and Carla. That's my daughter Anita and her husband David. That was taken uh, uh, when they got married. Uh, that would have been in 1992. Um, they both live in uh, BC, in Vancouver. Quite that is Michael Alexander Wetton, Anita's little boy. He is two. With a smiling face. He is too bad that he's so far away. That's my son Jeffrey and his wife Wendy. Yeah. Uh, that too was taken uh, at the day of uh, Anita's wedding. They're my grandchildren Jason and Emily, and they belong to Jeffrey and Wendy. Jason is now six, 
Emily is five. That's my newest addition. Noah Harrison Wolf is the newest addition to uh, Wendy and uh, Jeff as well, and a brother for Emily and Jason. As you can see, the uh, the frame gives you away what his name is. There's Noah's Ark on two by twos, and there's Noah. Uh, that's my daughter Lisa and uh, Larry Rothman. Uh, they live in Las Vegas, and uh, that too was taken the day of uh, Anita's wedding. They came in for that occasion. They've been there quite some time now. That's my grandson, Jake Rothman, who lives in Las Vegas with his mommy and daddy, Lisa and Larry. Uh, this picture was taken in the video on her bin of Jason, Wendy's, and Jeffrey's son. And on the left is my father. On the right, my mother. The two young men hanging on my arm are my twin grandsons, Ethan and Matthew. And the one in my hand is Jason. Uh, the lady in between myself and my father Mrs. Cameron, she helped me raise the children. She was with the family for 25 years. That's uh, my mom and dad. This too was taken in 1992. And they look like a very happy pair. And from these two people, I haven't counted how many offsprings there are, how many issues, but there's four and seven is eleven, twelve people. They're responsible for twelve people mm -hmm. so far.